topic entitled God's Washing Machine. The first mechanical washing machine was invented by the Romans in AD 1. It was a water powered washing machine. The first electric washing machine, at least in America, was invented in 1907. Looks pretty antiquated. But what's interesting to me, the basic design of the modern day washing machine that was invented back in 1908 has not changed much in over a hundred years. Still basically the same design unless you have one of these front-loading washing machines. It's a more modern style. And some of these modern washing machines are very sophisticated and very expensive. You could spend as much on a set like this as you would on a used car. Now that brings us to the question, does God have a washing machine? What is God's washing machine? Well, to answer that, we're going to the book of Ephesians. And if you're taking notes, we invite you to take notes. We're going to be reading Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Husbands, love your wives, Amen. even as Christ also loved the what? The church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. You can see the washing machine process here. The washing of water. You also see baptism symbolized. By the word, that he might present it, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Doesn't this sound like the washing machine process, ladies, when you do your clothes, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The church is God's washing machine. I gave you right at the beginning of my study what God's washing machine is. It is the church. And that brings me to this question, why go to church? Why do people attend church? There are several reasons why people go to church. The first reason is to socialize. People like to go because they have friends in the church, and it becomes a social experience. Now tell me, is that a good reason to go to church? No. Yes. 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 Well, it's not the best reason. No. It's not best. How about this one? People go to church because of habits. Yes. They've been doing it all their lives. Some people, they think as far back as they can remember. They were brought to church as infants, and they've just grown up going to church. It's a habit. Is that the best reason to go to church? No. 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 Other people go to church because of duty. They have a duty in the church. Maybe they're a deacon, or they're an elder, or they're a greeter, or they're an usher, or they have some duty in the church, play the piano or play something. And because of duty, they go. Is that the best reason to go to church? No. No. Other people go to church because it's entertaining. They like the preacher. He, says, he tells lots of jokes. They like the maybe the praise band, the praise team. They like the entertainment of the church. Is that the best reason to go to church? No. no. Other people go to church to worship God. Is that the best reason to go to church? Yes. yes. My question for you is why do you go to church? Don't answer that. Just answer that in your own mind. But that brings me to this question. What is the purpose of attending church? There are at least five reasons why we should regularly go to church. If you're taking notes, you want to mark down these five reasons. Number one, the most important reason, is to worship God. That's the best reason, I won't say the only reason, but that's the best reason why we ought to go to church. Jeremiah 26, verse 2. Who says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to what? Worship. To worship in the Lord's house. That's the best reason, the first reason to go to church. Number one, to worship God. Which brings me to the question, what does corporate worship include? Corporate worship, when we come together to worship in church, includes at least three things. First of all, it includes Bible study. We have Bible study in Sabbath school. 
We should have Bible study, a type of Bible study in the sermon. Bible study, that's one of the aspects of corporate worship. Another aspect is prayer and praise. And every Sabbath they have the prayer and praise time. That's a part of corporate worship. And then a third reason is giving, sharing. These are the three aspects of corporate worship. So the first reason to go to church, number one, is to worship God. The second reason is for fellowship. As we fellowship together, we are encouraged and strengthened in the Christian walk. 1 John 1 verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have what? fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We go to church for fellowship. I had a lady ask me one time at one of these prophecy seminars, I think it was like the second night, she came to me at the door after the meeting and she said, what's the real reason you're having these meetings? <laughs> like I had some evil agenda. What's the real purpose of this prophecy lecture series? Well, here's the answer from the Bible. Amen. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's go to the book of Acts. Acts 2 verse 47 says... Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. How were they added to the church? Let's go back to verse 41. Acts 2.41 says, Then they that gladly received his word, Peter's preaching, were baptized. And the same day were added unto them, that's the church, about 3,000 souls. Tonight we had two souls added to the church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Through baptism you are added to the church. After they were added to the church, notice, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and, what's the word? Fellowship. Fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. So after they joined the church, they continued attending church. I've always wondered, why would anybody want to join a church if they don't plan to attend church? What would be the purpose? That would be like getting married, but you're not planning to live together. <laughs> What's the reason then? And so it is with the church. When they join the church, they regularly attended church. Sometimes, sometimes people say, Pastor, can't I just stay home and worship God at home? Well, for a year now, over a year now, people have had a very good reason to stay home. In fact, for a period of time, you were told to stay home, right? COVID, because of COVID. But notice what the Bible says. Leviticus 23, verse 3. This is the answer from the Bible to the question, can't I just stay home and worship God at home? Here's the answer. God says, Leviticus 23, 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Can somebody tell me what does the word convocation mean? It means a coming together. We're having a convocation this evening where we're coming together to study God's Word. So the Sabbath... God says, is to be a holy convocation, not just stay home and worship God alone. Let's get a New Testament text. Here's what Paul says to the Hebrews, Hebrews 10, verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. Some people just stay home, worship God at home. Not, Paul says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As the day of Christ's coming approaches, we need to be more faithful in fellowshipping together. We live in a world with problems. You've seen that just in the last two weeks. This is a troubled world. We're living in troubled times. This is not the time to stay home. Home church. This is a time to come together. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, Paul says. So the second reason for attending church is for fellowship. As we fellowship together, we're encouraged in the strength and strengthened in the Christian life. And there are two aspects to fellowship. Put these in your notes. First is food, and second is friendship. When new people join the church, then we should make them feel like we are their friends. You know, how it is in the church, we have our friends that we've had for all these years. New people come in, it's like, well, hope they can find some friends. <laughs> You, as an older church member, need to befriend the new members. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And when they're not having fellowship meal, we didn't have fellowship meal today, I was so glad I got an invitation. Amen. <laughs> not every visitor today got an invitation. When they don't have fellowship meal, I want to challenge you older church members, look for some new member, some visitor, and invite them to your home. It's the best way to make friends. Amen. When you invite people home to have a meal with you, that's the way to make friends. Amen. Fellowship is food and friendship. Let's go to the third reason for attending church. Number three is for instruction in the truth. Acts 11, 25 and 26 says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Note that. And taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What do you think they taught? Truth or tradition? They taught the truth. Jesus was the one who said in John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you're not being taught the truth in the church that you're attending, then you need to ask yourself, am I in the right church? That's why God calls His people to come out of Babylon, to be a part of a commandment-keeping church. The third reason for regular church attendance is is for instruction in the truth. Fourth reason, number four, is for spiritual growth. As we study together, as we pray together, as we sing together, we grow spiritually together. Ephesians 4, 11 to 15 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are the gifts given to the church. If I want to benefit from the gifts of the Spirit given to the church, where must I put myself? At home on my sofa? <laughs> no. I have to go to church. And I have to go to the church that has all the gifts, including the gift of prophecy. For, here's the reason for the gifts, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ, that's the church. So these gifts were given to build up the church. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We'll come back to that verse. But speaking the truth in love may what? Grow up. May grow up into Him in all things, even which is the head, even Christ. So the fourth reason for regular church attendance is for spiritual growth. As we study, pray, and sing, we grow spiritually. However, the church is not just a place to go and feed my soul and get spiritually fat. If all I did was eat and I did no exercise, what would happen to me? I would grow, but it would be the wrong direction. I would get unhealthy. And so it is spiritually. If you don't do any spiritual exercise, your spiritual arteries will get all clogged up with spiritual cholesterol. The cholesterol of selfishness and self-pity. And you might have a spiritual heart attack and have a, or a spiritual stroke and die spiritually. The church was ordained for service. A church that's not a working church is what? Is a dead church or a dying church. Amen. 
as the church works together. We sing together, pray together, study God's word together, and work together to carry the gospel to our community. Then we grow spiritually. That's the fourth reason for regular church attendance. Let's go to the fifth reason. Number five is for safety. Number five, for safety. We read from verse 14, Ephesians 4, 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. The church provides us with the anchor of truth so that we're not blown around, blown away by all these winds of doctrines. That does not mean you won't feel the wind even in the church. But the church provides us with the anchor of truth so that we're not blown away, blown over by all these winds of doctrine. So number five, for safety. The church is likened to a sheepfold. Outside the fold are, are wolves, are dangers. That doesn't mean there aren't any wolves in sheep's clothes even inside the fold. But we let the shepherd take care of those. Amen. There are five reasons for attending church. Number one, for... Worshiping God. Number two, fellowship. Number three, instruction. Number four, spiritual growth. And number five, for safety. Now that brings me to another point. Jesus said in John 15, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. One of the ways that we abide in Christ is through regular church fellowship, church attendance. Why is that? Well, the Bible says in Colossians 1 verse 18, And he, that's Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. You have the picture? Christ is the head, the church is the body. In fact, notice Ephesians 5 verse 23 for another example. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. If I want to connect to Christ, who is the head, I must also connect to what else? The body, which is the, the church. What happens to a body part that's cut off or separated from the body? My father-in-law, when he was living, he had one hand with missing a finger. And back when he was a little boy growing up in Germany, he and his brother were chopping wood one day, and his brother said, here, you hold the wood, I'll chop. <laughs> Chopped off my father-in-law's finger. So he went through life missing a finger. Now, of course, today, they have the technology. If you get that body part quick enough, they can actually sew it back on sometimes and save it. But if that body part stays separated from the body very long, what happens? It will die. And of course, there's a spiritual lesson in that for us. In order to live and grow, we must remain connected to the body, the church. Christ is the head. The church is the body. In order to be connected to Christ, the head, we must also be connected to the body, which is the church. I have had some people tell me, Pastor, I want to get baptized, but I don't want to join a church. I don't want to be a part of a denomination. I think, I'm thinking, how can you do that? Suppose these four fingers of my hand were to say, we don't want to be connected to that old body. We just want to be connected to the head. You have these fingers sticking up out of your head. That wouldn't work. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. If you want to connect to the head, which is Jesus, we must also connect to the body, which is the church. Now that brings us to the question, are people that are not church members lost? Not necessarily. It depends on how God has been leading in their lives. In fact, if you'd like a text, put in your notes, Romans 2, 14 through 16, which tells us that even the Gentiles who don't know God, if they're living according to the principles of God in the judgment, they will be accepted. So that doesn't mean everybody that's outside of church is lost. God is working to bring those outside of the church into the body. What about people that can't come to church because of physical uh, handicaps or ailments? 
the church has a responsibility to reach out to those individuals that cannot come to church so that they can still stay connected to the body. Amen. Now there might be a few rare situations where maybe somebody's in solitary confinement in prison. Nobody's allowed to contact them. In those rare situations, God will sustain that person if they're surrendered to Christ, even though they're separated from the body. But mark this. God will not sustain a person spiritually who willfully separates from the church or refuses to unite with the church body. In order to connect to Christ the head, we have to also be connected to the body, which is the church. church. Now that brings us to another big question. Important question. Does it matter to God which church I attend? Since I have to connect to the church to be connected to the head, does God care which church I connect to? Well, the answer to that question lies in the answer to the question, does God have a church church on earth? If he does, then of course he would want me to connect to the true church. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, he says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the what? The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the, tr of the truth. God does have a church, true church. Amen. Now just as surely as God has a true church, there's a host of counterfeits. For example, if you add up a column of numbers mathematically, how many right answers are there? One. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> how many wrong answers are there? Infinite. Yes. There's an infinity of wrong answers. Just so we know there's only one true church, but there today there's at least 47,000 different churches. Churches and groups. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5, there is one body. What's the body? The Colossians 1, 18, the body is the church. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Amen. So there's only one true church. Do you know why there's only one body? Because there's only one head. How many bodies do connect to one head? A body with more than one head is what? That's a beast. Remember those beasts that had more than one head? A body with no head is what? A corpse. Dead. A head with more than one body is what? It is an impossibility. You don't find that anywhere in the spiritual world or in the natural world. Since there is one head, we can know there is only one true body, one true church. In fact, Jesus himself indicates that from John 10. Let's go read John 10, 14 through 16. Put it in your notes. John 10, 14 through 16, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Alright, let's review. The good shepherd is who? Jesus. Jesus. The sheep are who? Uh, I hope that's you. What's the fold? The church. That has to be the church. Since Jesus is the good shepherd, his followers are the sheep, the fold would have to be the church. And Jesus says, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Where are they then? Well, they're in some other fold and they're at some other church. He says, them also I must bring, bring to where? This fold. To the fold. And he says there shall be how many? One. one fold and one shepherd. If you like the Old Testament parallel passage to this, to John 10, you can put in your notes Ezekiel 34. Verse 6, God says, my sheep are scattered all over the world. 
In verses 11 and 12, God says, I myself will seek my sheep. And then in verse 16, God says, Ezekiel 30, 34, 16, He says, when I find my sheep, I'm going to bring them again. Bring them to where? Well, Jesus tells us where. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. Bring to where? This fold. To the fold, the true church. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. If you are one of Christ's sheep, and you're not yet in his fold, the true church, what is the shepherd doing in your life? He is, in his providential way, guiding you to that one true fold. Them also I must bring. I had a man tell me one time, he said, Pastor, I don't like to think of myself as a sheep. To be led around and told what to do, where to go, what to, where to go to church. And I thought to myself, I wonder who was the originator of that attitude. It was the devil in heaven said, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to have freedom. God says, I give you freedom. Mm -hmm. That's why we have this whole sin problem, because of freedom of choice. But listen, if you really want freedom, surrender your life to Jesus. <laughs> then you find true freedom. Amen. But listen, if you want to follow the Lord, it takes a commitment. Take, for example, marriage. Marriage is a commitment, right? Suppose we were at the wedding of John and Sue. We had a wedding last night. This is another wedding we're imagining. We're at the wedding of John and Sue. And they're standing there before the preacher getting ready to go through the vows. And before they go through the vows, John leans over to Sue and he says, he whispers to her, he says, I want to make something very clear to you, Sue. I don't plan to spend every day with you. I don't plan to spend every night with you. I have to have my freedom. <laughs>
them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Hear my voice. That is the consolation for every evangelist and every pastor. You see, the work of soul winning is a work of joy and a work of sorrow. There is the joy of seeing people accept the Lord and follow truth. We had that joy here this evening. Amen. Amen. But there's also the sorrow of seeing people hear the truth and turn away. And the consolation that comes to every evangelist, every pastor, is this. 